lazy volition about the strategies of the Russian actionists in Europe. Um, one can think that we have two different, very different powers in our life. One of these is uh, one of those are capitalism, effectivity, productivity, and creativity, understood as a uh, as, as our ability to participate in the capitalist models of production. The other way of life is laziness, being ineffective, ineffective, being somehow free from all of these uh, effectivity constraints, being free from being productive, being unproductive, being zero productive. One can think that these two things are really di are very different, but this is not so. And the art history of the last 150 years shows us that there is a huge interconnection between two things and maybe the later story of Russian actionism is one of the things that can uh, make, give a, an illustration for this a bright and vivid color of illustration so but we can we will start from the early times from the American literature of the 19th century here we can see German Melville and his hero Bartleby with his famous phrase I would prefer not to. I would prefer not to, this is the words told by Bartleby every time when he had been forced to do anything as it's going out of the some kind of strict contract he signed in the beginning. I would prefer not to the praise the words which were the symbol of his denial to participate in any kind of social interactions. He would prefer not to not to do any kind of work he shouldn't do, not to leave the place where he lived, and this was, was actually his workplace, not to leave it even when his company left, not to leave, and finally not to eat and to die. To die free and to die without any kind of force, not without being forced uh, into to participate in any kind of uh, alien reality. So, and this could be the start of the large part of the avant-garde movement of the 20th and the 21st century. About 50 or 70 years later, after this Bartleby by German Melville, then um, Artur Kravan, uh, European or we can more say international, early Dadaist, pre-Dadaist artist had started his own career, or own career. He published everything he every kind of dirty pamphlets about his fellow avant-garde artists. He uh, made a pseudo-career in boxing, he created uh, lots of legends around, he uh, ev tried to do th something that each of his... Uh, each of the time when he is going into some public space, each of the time when he is performing, each of these times should be a scandal. But no more than that. He was also a poet, but as an artist, as a performing artist, he was he was a performing artist, but he was doing the zero art. And that was going on for ten years until he disappeared somewhere in the Mexican Gulf. Or maybe it's another legend about him 
Maybe he not disappeared anywhere. Maybe he was leaving. Uh, maybe that's just a final work of art by Arthur Cravan. Then we can proceed, of course, with lots of different artists like the father and the founder of uh, avant-garde, Marcel Duchamp, who, uh, who made his main idea that laziness, um, who glorified laziness in his art. So, and that was some kind of his of his uh, his main idea, as he told it once. Um, here we can think about Marcel Duchamp ready-made. Here we can think about um, also also many other authors like Kazimir Malevich, who wrote the you know, a work as a laziness as a unique. A unique trash of the humanity or Paul Lafarge uh, 40 years before Malevich who uh, wrote about the uh, right to be lazy which we, we in our industrial societies are uh, left for the, our industrial way of life and uh, there was things was going and going on, but as the old early avant-garde art died out and the global infrastructure of um, more contemporary art have risen, the art industry have became more and more bound to productivity, to being effective, to being centered uh, on galleries, on art system on many other parts of art life that one have to work with. For example, this conference is one of those types of life of an artist or researcher, which is a part of that system system of effectivity system of action and system of producing something that could be counted as a art piece as an art piece but this was the situation only on the way in the west in the east we can find quite another situation here in eastern europe in communist world you don't have any kind of this market system in the second half of the 20th century. Moreover, if you are doing art, independent art, you are not able to be part of anything. You are not able to be part of the local art system, of the local society, of the local uh, culture. You are alternative and alternative to all of this life. And you can be lazy. You don't need to work too much because to live in this kind of uh, socialist societies, one doesn't need to work too much. But in the authoritarian atmosphere of these societies, you cannot be part of it. So you don't need to produce anything. You could be an artist just by thinking about art, talking about art with friends, and doing something that you only you identify as art, or maybe some kind of closed circle of your friends. You don't need anything more. So, Eastern artists, Eastern laziness in art were not then that characterized into some kind of leftist, small subcultural get as it was in the West. For example, we can think here about uh, Yugoslavian artist Mladen Stilinovic, who did his uh, art piece 
working artist. It was in the year 1978. And in this art piece, he just been lying in the bed, moving from one part of the bed to another, and sleeping. And this was the work of art, and this was the work of art called The Artist is Working. So he doesn't need to produce anything, he just needs to think, or to sleep, and produce his own personal dreams. He wrote about 15 years later that in the West, Artists are not lazy, so they are not artists, but uh, they are those people who are, they are work, basically they are workers. Uh, and when the communist system fall, this Eastern type of artist thought have made a huge entrance to the West. Doors have been opened, and the West who have been thinking that, oh, okay, that is this Eastern people, Eastern dissidents who should support and who should be part of our art system, they doesn't want to be, doesn't don't want to become any kind of part of this art system, and we can think that that has been started from the very early time, when the first Moscow. Uh, in the, uh, artists interven art interventionists, actionists, as it's called as a Moscow actionist movement, have entered the West and have been trying to make their own art in the West. For example, here we can think about Alexander Brenner, who in like uh, just in the year 1994 did their first actions in uh, 1996 did his first actions in the West. This was an exhibition in Interpol with Oleg Kulik and many other people on, in February of 1996. So during all these exhibitions there was a huge conflict between Eastern people and Western people. Between Swedish artists who have been centered in producing art of art pieces without any kind of thinking about it and Moscow, St. Petersburg, or Slovenian artists who have been talking more about the concept and more about their thoughts than about actually producing any pieces. And this was a conflict. When the exhibition began, there was no Russian work of art on this exhibition. Actually, Stockholm people, Swedish people, doesn't want to do this. They doesn't want to exhibit even work so far that was presented. So, basically, Alexander Brenner did his performance. He destroyed 20 meters long uh, installation by Chinese Wen Dagu. And the, the reaction was immediate. All the documentation of the Alexander Brenner performance of the Oleg Kulik performance at the same place, and all other Russian performances uh, uh, at this exhibition have been destroyed. And this thing have been called by Western curators as a totalitarian attempt to subjugate Western art to the Easterners, as an imperialist act of the former Soviet Union. Well... You will say that it's something that is like one time random thing, but it's not random thing. And we can see how this non random thing are being performed now. Now we have two um, of the three probably main Russian actionists being in the West and living in the West. That is like Voina Group, Oleg Voratnikov, Natalia Sokol, and their kids. Their art in the West is basically their lifestyle. Their lifestyle, which consists in shoplifting, in squatting the flats of wealthy 
and famous or not so wealthy and not so famous European intellectuals who once been thinking that can they can like let them live for a day and uh, okay there's a family with the three, three kids who can who can live with us for a day of course they are not living for a day but they are living uh, at this squatted place of the western art person as long as they can and they use everything the west can give to them they steal everything and they do it as, as the everyday performance everyday documented in their instagram in their facebook in their videos to document all of their life despite this documentation are is permanently destroyed by different people who doesn't like them so much they're squatting their flats they are stealing their food not they but corporations but who cares come on and that is the art and this is the art which is the zero art which is a non-productive art and anti-productive art and this is their protest and this is their anarchist gesture the gesture against all of the types of the western art system and social system one of those gestures and of course being officially in the interpol wanted list in the list of most wanted by russian people who are most wanted by russian government and being in europe they openly support russian government because well they support russia and they do not support all kinds of the western art system why because they are trying to make a strict distinction between them and between their art uh, and between the art system and between the capitalist system and they use the demonized uh, image of Russian dictatorship which is actually a dictatorship and the old image of the Cold War time as some kind of their symbol as a symbol of their ability to be dissident and to be free also in European situation the very analogical situation is the situation of Peter Pavlensky who is now for about a year is held being held into the French prison into French prison because he remade his own action which he had been done in Moscow in Moscow he set to fire the doors of the Russian secret service FSB in Paris where he had been granted asylum he set fire to the French National Bank also only to the door nothing real have been done that's just symbolic gesture and we see also two important differences in Russia he had been in prison for five months he was the all courts all, um, uh, about uh, him was open and in France he is in prison for about a year or will be a prisoner for at least a year just before any kind of court decision and there is basically no information about the process because no press could be during the could be allowed to the courtroom and so we see he's also doing his art by doing nothing by doing small gesture and that's seeing the reaction of the society and that's seeing how the russian society is not that much different from the french society their repressive repressive mechanisms are the same and how so-called free west does not want to see any kind of dissent if that kind of dissent is not going from the inside but some kind but if that kind of dissent is going to from some alienated and marginalized country and people from this that alienated and marginalized country could speak only about their country 
but not about the world as a whole. That's what I think.